hope we can conclude what we did some started some time ago as far as the book of Hebrews is concerned. I think you'll remember at that time that I said I was motivated to do what I've done in our study together from the book of Hebrews because of the typology theme that was that of the Bellevue Lectures in Pensacola, Florida some weeks ago. And I might say in passing, but we still have some of those books, $5 a piece available, that I personally think out of all the years as far as practical studies and rightly dividing or handling right the word truth is just excellent that if you would like to have them, they are available. But in that, it makes you realize that when you go back and study the Old Testament, one of the great ways that God sent forth His message and still does in the New Testament is typology. And so that motivated me to look back at Hebrews, though some months ago we studied it verse by verse. And you'll remember that we have thus far considered the better revealer, Jesus Christ, who is the better mediator, the better rest provider, who provides the better rest, the better high priest than the high priest under the law of Moses for the Jews, because he has a better covenant. And the better tabernacle, the better sacrifice, the better promises. And today I want to finish this all up by looking how that we as children of God, Christians, members of the Lord's church, have the better way. Maybe you understand now why Al Brown so long ago named the bulletin the better way. The way of faith is what the better way is. Contrasted with the system that is pure law, which basically says the law of sin and death, you sin and you die. Doesn't mean that the law of Christ is not just that, the perfect law of liberty, James 1.25. The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. But it means something that we fail to get sometimes concerning the design and purpose of the law of Moses for the Jews and the design and purpose of the New Testament system of salvation for every man until the end of time. The way of the Christ, the way of the new covenant, the way of the new priesthood is the better way. The better way is the way of faith. This is the point that is stressed in chapter 10, verse 19 of the book of Hebrews, all the way through the end of the book, chapter 13, verse 25. Now I want to remind you that here is a letter written to Christians who are to Jews who become Christians. And as members of the church in Jerusalem and Judea and round about, or anywhere Jews would be members of the church, but especially in that area. Then this letter to those was designed to strengthen them. Strong rebukes are in this letter because you'll remember that the writer had said, when by reason of time you ought to be teachers, you have need that one teach you again of the first principles of the oracles of God. You're not able to handle strong meat. You have to be fed again the milk of the word. Thus they had had time Plenty of time to be to where they knew the gospel well enough in the New Testament system to teach others, but they weren't able to do so. And this sure tells us a lot when he says that it's because you didn't use your time right. That implies God expects us as Christians to use our time right. And that ties back into Matthew 6 verse 33, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things shall be added unto you. And if that doesn't mean our use of time, then I don't know what it would mean. So he's concerned about these folks remaining faithful. We sang a while ago about loving one another. Well, his love for them was to show them their sins because in those sins they were practicing, they would not go to heaven. 
I cannot believe that somebody can say I'm a child of God, I'm a Christian, one who is of Christ, a faithful member of the church that Jesus purchased with his blood. And I love my brethren, but I'm certainly not going to deal with their sins. No, you don't even love yourself, much less God or your brethren. Sin is the only thing that can separate us from God. Jesus solved the sin problem. And his power to save us from sin, he located in the gospel, Romans 1.16. Paul said, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Well, you say, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Oh, yeah, we really are. When well, we won't show what the gospel teaches to our brethren who are caught up in whatever sin they may be. When we have direct, explicit instruction, ye which are spiritual, restore such in one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Now, that's what this writer of Hebrews is doing in writing part of the New Testament of Jesus Christ who showed us how to love each other and love all men. And so these who had heard the gospel sometime in their past had from the heart believed it and obeyed it. Now we're actually thinking about leaving the whole New Testament system due to persecution and privation that had come upon them because they were Christians and going back under the law of Moses. So as he concludes this great letter, and remember, most of the letters are written to Christians on being faithful once you become a Christian. In chapter 10, verses 19 through verse 39 of chapter 10, the inspired writer exhorts those addressed to be faithful. Now I want you to think about this for a minute because every sermon, if it's what it ought to be, is designed to exhort people to be faithful. To either teach them about what faith really is and what a saving faith is and what a dead faith is and what a weak faith is, what a strong faith is, what a living faith is. But in some way or the other, it's saying you must be faithful as the New Testament defines faithfulness or you will not go to heaven. And here are people who had made such a great step while they heard the truth and they believed it and they left what had been everything about them as a nation. And they believed and obeyed the gospel. They were baptized into Christ. And now due to persecution, they're actually thinking, because they haven't grown spiritually. They haven't used their time to study their Bibles or to pray. I guess you'd say they were coasting Christians, and that's really an impossibility. And now they're actually falling away. So this letter is a letter of love to our brethren, confronting them with their sins. And one of them is, you haven't used your time right. If you were, you'd be teaching people rather than have to be taught. He says that because we have boldness as faithful children of God, and basing all of this as his last argument on all that has come before, and because we have this great high priest, Jesus Christ, over the house of God, the church, the family of God, here's what he says ought to be happening. Let us, number one, draw near. Draw near to God. I don't know how to do that, but to know more of my Bible and do all I can to live it, to teach it, and to pray without ceasing in all things in prayer and supplication, make my request made known to God, to do whatever sacrifices must be done in my life in order to stay with the truth, regardless of what anybody else thinks about me. He says then also not only to draw near, but he says hold fast. How can you do them one without the other? To hold fast. You know, when... When you hold fast, you won't let go. You just won't let go. But they were letting go. But he says that the way of faith, the better way, means you won't let go. And that reminds us again of the most common passage in 1 Corinthians 15, 58. Be you steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Knowing this, that your labor is not in vain. It's not pointless. It's not worthless. Where? In the Lord. Of course, Paul had written to the church in Ephesus saying in Ephesians 1 3 that all spiritual blessings in heavenly places are located somewhere in Christ. And in Galatians 3 26 and 27, we learn that upon our faith in Christ, we're baptized into Christ. So we can be in Christ. So we can enjoy the, all of the spiritual blessings that are in heavenly places that God's located there. Hold fast to these things. And all that that implies. And number three, consider one another. What? Oh, it's got kind of personal now. You know, to put it bluntly, our inclination is I don't really give a hoot and a guinea. 
about my brethren a lot of times as to what they do. I don't want to get too close to you, Jess. Either one of you, however you spell your name. I don't want to get too close to you, Eric or Danny. And I really don't want you to get very close to me because that means I have to get mixed up in your life. It means I've got to get so close to you as a brother and sister in the family of God that I have to learn your needs and your shortcomings. And above all, you may learn my shortcomings. <laughs> you ever wondered when you come down to the teaching of the Bible on those who will be good shepherds and all that shepherding means as elders, why that the church is admonished to know them that labor among you? And on the other hand, the elders and shepherds doing the work of shepherds and all that, that implies, they're to know the members. Consider one another. Well, how is it we can pray so much to love one another and sing songs about loving one another and helping one another and pray about each other and all that? I'd end up knowing something about one another that other people don't know. And that doesn't mean your life is an open book and all your private affairs to all there is, but as far as your spirituality is concerned, we need to be considering one another every day. Now, in this connection, the inspired writer stresses the importance, and we might wonder about this, but he stresses, he emphasizes, he bears down on the importance of assemblies, of what we shall call assemblies of exhortation. These assemblies of exhortation provide exhortation because of what goes on in those assemblies that each member of those assemblies are doing. And all you have to do is think about what we've done thus far. Gathered here by the authority of Christ on the first day of the week, and in this gathering, this assembly, acting upon the authority of His Word to do praise and honor to Him. That's why we're here, not to praise each other. Yet the fallout of it, if you want to call it that, is that by our singing these songs of hymns and praise, and songs, with the right attitude of heart, directing that worship to God, praying to God as the Bible teaches us to pray, giving of our means that we planned on doing and intended to do, and then even prepared to study the Bible and so forth. Observing the Lord's Supper, showing forth His death that He'll come again by partaking of the bread and memory of the body offered on Calvary's tree. And partaking of the fruit of the vine, remembering the blood shed for the remission of sin. You see, all of that when we participate in writing, you have to be taught correctly, don't you, to participate correctly. All that serves to exhort me to be faithful in the coming week. All that serves to exhort me to study my Bible, to pray, to be mindful of the sick and the afflicted and the orphans and the widows, because I'm to practice pure and undefiled religion. Each member of the church is. And when each member does it, all are doing it. All can't do it unless each one does. James 1.27 And to keep myself unspotted from the world, and you have to study the New Testament to see all that, that involves. Christians are not known for lying. They're not known for committing fornication and adultery, and being covetous. Christians are known for their study of the Bible and doing only what's authorized by the New Testament because they love God and love God to keep His commandments and all that that entails. So these assemblies of exhortation and what goes on in them, delivered in praise of God, worshiping Him in spirit and in truth. And you can't assemble every day doing all of these but the one observance of the Lord's Supper, which we authorize to partake of on the first day of the week in the assemblies of saints. All this serves to strengthen us. And we do remember that the early church did assemble daily after it first started. So these are not to be forsaken. They're for our good. And yet you still find people in the Lord's church saying, do I have to? And you know immediately when the question is raised, you're dealing with somebody as weak as, weak as water. The writer discusses the very seriousness of willful sin. I know that sin, I know I'll go to hell and do it, but I like it, I'm going to do it anyway. Oh, God forbid we be involved in that kind of disposition of mind toward any commandment of God. And he sets forth a vivid description of the fully developed apostate. That these people need to hear this because that's where you're headed. You see, the idea that says, well, let's see, let me, 
let me take the scale, and I've got 95% of my life in harmony with God's will. 5% over here, well, this outweighs that. If you're thinking that way, you're lost already. You're lost already. The writer refers to their coming to know the gospel. You see, they had endured. They, it's not like they'd never bore up under persecution. They had suffered. He reminds them of these things. They had had concern for others. And they certainly had possessed, because of that faithfulness, their marvelous expectation of heaven when they died. But they were being persecuted now beyond what maybe they thought they ought to have to undergo. Even though they knew the Lord said, take up your cross daily and follow me. So he says in the light of all of this, in verses 35 and 36 of chapter 10, Notice it's something they do. Nobody's taking it away from them by their actions or lack thereof. They do this. He says, cast not away therefore your boldness. The therefore means in the light of what I've just shown you, why would you want to do it anyway? Cast not away therefore your boldness, which hath great recompense of reward. And then notice where the problem is. For ye have need of patience. You know, we'd be surprised if, if we just would realize, I know what the Bible says. I know what my duty is. It doesn't make any difference from male or female, old or young or sick or well or wealthy or poor or middle class or American or Russian or Chinese, or whatever language I speak or whether I'm a young couple or an old couple or whatever. It doesn't make a bit of difference. If I know that I know, that I know I'm doing what God said to do in the way God said to do it and for the reason or if there is more than one reason he said to do it, I'm obedient to God. Well, today is a whole lot harder on me than it was yesterday. <laughs> and my life has got to the point to where, why well, it's just uh, really a lot of problems uh, because I obey God. And that's the key, because I obey God. Don't you think that's enough and maybe... Maybe I need, need a little relief. Maybe we reach what I call the Jerry Clower story of the fight with the lynx on the top of the tree. And he begs for somebody to shoot the thing. And the one comes back that has the gun, says, can't shoot, it may hit you. And he says, shoot up here amongst us. One of us got to have relief. I really believe, as funny as that is. The Christians reach that stage sometime. And you can see why they would. They haven't used their time properly. They don't have proper knowledge. And you cannot have a proper faith without proper knowledge of the Word of God. For faith comes by hearing the Word of God, Romans 10, 17. And we must walk by faith and not by sight, 2 Corinthians 5, 7. And you can't walk by faith and not as things appear to the five senses. And that's what that means. Unless you have full confidence in God based on His Word. And He's already given them Hebrews 11, to show that people that never did have the New Testament system were faithful to God under patriarchy and the law of Moses. And what all they endured. So you had need of patience. Well, their patience, as it's used in the scriptures, means bear up under the burden when you know you're right, when you know you're doing what God said. No matter what happens, whether it's easy today or whether it's hard because you are a Christian and because you live according to the authority of Christ. You keep on doing what's right. You keep on doing what's right as the Bible defines the right. It never gets you down. Why would it? When you have a proper understanding. For you have need of patience. That having done the will of God, you may receive the promise. You know, really, this is not a passage for good old Americans. Because I worked hard this week and I want my paycheck before I go home. The Lord never said that's the way it would be in serving Him and going to heaven. The writer closes this particular section in verse 39 by saying, But we are not of them which shrink back unto perdition. We're not of those like we never heard the gospel, don't care about it, live on the level of the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, of pride of life. We're not like those. We're not... Sunshine patriots, fair weather soldiers. We're not just faithful to God when everything's just going smooth and everybody's saying what fine folks we are. 
You're faithful to God all the time because it's the only way you're going to go to heaven. And He's already given what we've read in Hebrews 11 and so on. Or He's, he's written that to them that fits into this very, very chapter. But we are not of them that shrink back into perdition, but of them that have faith unto the saving of the soul. And I must raise the question now, are we? In all these years of preaching the gospel in every church I've worked with and visiting with many gospel preachers and being with many other churches, I have never seen things change. There's always people in those churches who are there when everything is easy. They have no problems personally. They have really no big problems in their family. They don't have really any problem in the church. But then they have the Job virus hit them. At least they think it is, though I've never known anybody to undergo what Job did. <laughs> and they say, why me? And I'm usually trying to say to them, why not you? Or why not me? What makes any one of us special? Yeah, it tends to tell us something about ourselves when we will even ask the question, why me? Who do you think you are? <laughs> Who do I think I am? Why shouldn't it be that way with you and me if we want to grow in spiritual things? So we need to hold fast to the truth when we know it's the truth, whether it's a good day or a bad day, the truth hasn't changed and that which saves us has not changed. In chapter 11, we have then a beautiful, wonderful, and amazing discussion of saving faith. The writer considers, watch this, and when you read chapter 11, keep this in mind. He considers the meaning of faith. He refers to faith that is characteristic of all these brethren, if you want to call them that, men of old. He mentions something about the value of faith. And he stresses the sensuality of faith. Then he begins to set forth certain tremendous patterns or examples of availing faith, of saving faith, of a living active faith, of an obedient faith. And he writes of Abel and Enoch and Noah and Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. He wrote about Sarah. He wrote about Joseph. He wrote about Moses, Israel. He wrote about Gideon and Rahab, Barak and Samson and Jephthah, David, Samuel, the prophets and countless others. And he said this about them of whom the world was not worthy. And they never knew a thing about the gospel of Christ. In its entirety is revealed in, New Testament, in the New Testament. But the world wasn't worthy of them. Now... A lot of people have all sorts of problems thinking they're worthless. <laughs> they have a poor self-image. They get down on themselves. Oh me, how pitiful I am. And they all have a pitiful party. And they pay countless thousands of the insurance companies due to counselors and to whatever else. Their own value and they're telling whatever because they're just down and out. <laughs> right here is a solution. Right here he tells you in Hebrews 11 how it is that you can live through thick and thin, good and bad. As Paul said, I've learned in whatsoever state I am to be content. Paul wasn't American, was he? <laughs> because we haven't learned to, to a great extent whatsoever state we're in to be content. We're just like some bunch of ants in a fire ant hill when you've kicked it. That's how we are. <laughs> Then in chapters 12 and 13, the great inspired writer considers the fruits of faith. What faith bears out in a person's life. Now you know all of this was to be lit, written to these people originally and they must be sitting there honestly receiving it, comparing and contrasting their lives with what all he said. What is my faith like? Well you can go there and can compare and contrast. You can take the divine revelation of faith and all I said a moment ago and you can say, do, do, I, do I live like this? 
Is my outlook on life like their outlook on life was? Am I really benefiting from the Old Testament lessons that was written aforetime for my learning that I, through patience and comfort of the Scriptures, might have hope, Romans 15, 4? Or are these just reading about Star Wars and the Jedi Knights? Or maybe Middle Earth? <laughs> if that's your approach to things, the Bible never will benefit you and you'll go to hell. It's just that simple. Oh, it's harsh to say that. Well, where are most people going to go who are accountable to God? Most of them are going to go to heaven. Show me a passage in the Bible, Old or New Testament, that says most people who have ever lived on this earth that are accountable to God are all headed for heaven. It's right the opposite, isn't it? That very, 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 very few, few, few people will receive with meekness the engrafted word and will be steadfast all through their lives and be faithful, even if it cost them their life, to receive the crown of of righteousness, the crown of life, Romans, or rather Revelation 2.10. So in chapters 12 and 13, we have the fruits of faith. We list these as follows. Endurance. How much of that do you see around you? Just endure. Well, it hurts. So you walk off and leave it. If people had this one quality of faith in their marriages, it would stop most of the divorces today. There was a time in our nation when this permeated the core of the morality of our nation to where they realized that everything is not a birthday party. That what is right is to do right even when it hurts you to do right because it's right. You endure. Anybody ever heard of the Alamo? Now you tell me why those people died in that place. They didn't have to. They could have left. And for such a goal as a secular goal like that, yet they stayed there knowing they were going to die and they died. Now when it comes to the greatest kingdom of all kingdoms of which there is no greater the kingdom of God of which we are citizens in particular. Do we endure? Well holiness being dedicated set apart so you can do God's will. Righteousness always concerned about doing God's will. Being righteous by doing righteousness. Peace not the peace of the world but the peace that knows you're at peace with God through faithful obedience to God. Sanctification, by all of this, we're set apart. We're suitable for the master's service. We're not like the world. We don't live on the level of the world. And then the blessings, the great privileges of being a child of God, a citizen of the kingdom of heaven, a member of the church. There are not many of them around. And then the responsibilities. Oh, that's another story. The responsibilities, the discharging of our obligations from which, of which we learn in the New Testament of being members of the church of our Lord. Which he says is the kingdom which cannot be shaken. Now, what kingdom or government among men cannot be shaken? But the kingdom of heaven cannot be shaken. There's brotherly love. There's compassion. There's respect for the organization of the church, the elders and the deacons and the preachers and the members. There's respect and love for the truth that sets us free, which means the study of it, the living with it, and the meditating on it. There's the scriptural praise of God and the prayerfulness and the perfection in every good thing and obedience always. For let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep His commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. These, I've just mentioned, are the marvelous and amazing fruits of faith. Demanded and made possible by the system of faith. For which we are to contend and put to practice in our lives. Jude 3. Now you can see why he ends here. Because everything that we mentioned, that we've studied in this brief study, has led us to that very point. Without the system of faith that is the New Testament system, the perfect law of liberty, none of these things are possible. 
And we have them. We dare not let them go. This is the way to heaven. This is the straight and narrow way. This is the way that Jesus said one must believe and walk in to get to heaven. You know, it's interesting that God never did say in solving the sin problem and make it possible for us to go to heaven. Well, let's see. This is just kind of hard on them right here. I think I'll let up on it. So we make, when we, when we sit down in heaven here at the great planning table and plan out how we're going to save them, well, this just seems a little tough. So let's lighten up here. That's not the way he did it. He said, this is the way, the only way, and if you will not enter this way, you won't get there. It has to be this way. There's no deviation of it. And we sing the old song, the way of the cross. Leads home. Then Jesus said, you take up your cross daily and follow me. The rejoicing comes later. But there's a rejoicing now that says I'm reconciled to God. He hears my prayers. He'll see me through. Well, but you don't understand how He's going to do it every day. I don't have to. He tells me to be faithful to Him and everything else works. He's taking God at His word. And we need to learn that. These folks hadn't. They had not spent their time studying the Bible. They had lost what they had. And now you see where that leads. We'll just give up the whole New Testament system and go out here with our fleshly brethren and go back to the easy way. Everybody around us is keeping the law and they don't like us anyway. We've had trouble all this. After all, we once approached God under the law and that was acceptable. Why can't we still do it? Well, if they had spent their time in studying the Scriptures, they would know such things as Paul wrote to the Galatians saying, Whosoever you are that are justified by the law, ye are fallen from grace. They would know those things. They would know what he had to write to them in Hebrews. They would know the application of the Old Testament to the New Testament. But what they didn't. They were too busy in something that I'm sure they thought was very important. But they were negligent. Clearly, it's the case that Christians have the better way. Let's rehearse and then close the lesson. First of all, the better revealer. Next of all, the better mediator. The better rest provider. The better rest. The better high priest. The better covenant. The better tabernacle. The better sacrifice. The better promises in what we studied today, the better way, the way of faith, the way of the living, active, obedient faith that produces the better life that gives us the better hope. And why Paul could say in Romans 8, 24, we're saved by hope. For early Jewish Christians to forsake the gospel and try to go back to the Moabite system, which of course was Judaism, would be for them to forsake the superior an attempt to return to the inferior. And let's just close with chapter 12, 1 and 2. Remember where it is, chapter 12, 1 and 2, and what preceded it in chapter 11. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us and let us run with patience. The American Standard has steadfastness here, ASV 1901. The race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher. Again, the American Standard has the perfecter of our faith. Here's the way we'll view life then as he viewed it. He viewed it from this standpoint. Who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Chapter 12, 1 and 2. Our problem so many times today is we're trying to set down before the work's over with. We're trying to find heaven on earth in the flesh and you will not do so. We can sit down when the work's finished. And that'll be when your life is over and done with. As long as we're here, we're to be faithful. Now doesn't this give us a better understanding of why that they were exhorted in Revelation 2? Be thou faithful unto death 
and I will give thee the crown of life. Now that's when you can sit down and say, Whew, work's done. Let's enjoy it. If you're not a child of the living God this morning, you can be before you leave this building. By believing on the basis of the testimony of the word that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the Son of God. Repent of your sins. That is, turn away from all things that are contrary to His will with the purpose of heart. Never to violate His will again. To confess your faith in the Christ of the Son of God. Romans 10.10 10. And to be buried with your Lord in baptism for the remission of sins. To rise and walk this new life of faith in the church of the living God. Being faithful till He calls you home. As a child of God, were you in need of this letter written so long ago to those brethren who were sleeping? If so, receive the messages they should have, and I hope they did. Repent of those sins, whatever they may be. And once again, live by faith as the New Testament fully teaches it until Christ calls you home. Folks, let's all go to heaven and let's all help each other to do the same. If you're subject to the invitation of our blessed Christ, we invite you to come while we stand and sing.